one. and turned on. <laughs> yeah. I just use it like this. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we're about to get started. So today we're talking about migrating at scale and how not to fail. So um, this is assuming that you are already familiar with migrations. If you've never done a migration before, then this is not necessarily the session for you. We're just going to be, there will be some code later on, and it's don't assume you've already written YAML files or you've written process plugins and so on. So, first, quick introduction to ourselves. I'm Stella Power, I'm the managing director of Anertech. This is a digital agency based out of Ireland, but we're actually distributed all across Europe. And uh, yeah, I'm a recovering back end developer too. So, while I am managing director, every so often I like to get my hands dirty in code, and what I like to do are migrations. And I'll pass over to Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Erskine. I've been working with Drupal for about 12 years. I've been working with Anatech for about a year and a half. Um, I primarily do back-end development. Uh, far too many migrations. Um. There's never too many migrations. Uh, so, Anertech specializes in, well, Drupal, that's why we're here. Uh, and a lot of what we do are integrations and migrations, and a lot recently of migrating from legacy Drupal 7 sites. Given that end of life for Drupal 7 is next year, trivia question hint, um, that's not surprising. So, recently we were tasked by University of Limerick to take uh, their existing Drupal 7 infrastructure and migrated to Drupal 9. So they have over 200 sites and we decided for phase one that we would take 50 of those. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, governance of the, of the, so there is a number of sites in a multi-site platform and then there is a, a, lots of sites that are sort of standalone. So governance was proving tricky. Uh, every site had a different login. While well, some of them were similar, some of them were not. So a course on one site, course node, for example, uh, was a bit different on other sites. The person content type on one site was different from another site. So they had, <clears throat> while some of them had started from the same base, they had diverged over time. Maintenance was a bit of a nightmare as well. Security updates, different modules. Some had extra plugins. Some of the modules weren't, you know, uh, supported anymore. So the plan was, or the decision was taken to uh, upgrade it to Drupal 9. So as I mentioned, for phase one, which we've just completed, we took a subset of 50 sites. Now these were the 50 sites that were on a multi-site installation. And uh, so the, we were migrating them onto one single unified Drupal 9 platform. This would allow the University of Limerick to centrally manage all of the logins, all the permission, and have one platform to maintain. For this, we decided to use the group module. Hands up, anyone who's ever used the group module or is familiar with it. Okay, good. So, Every department used to have their own website, or every school in the university had their own website. They now became a group with their own editors and their own content. So if you're an editor for a particular school's website, you logged in and then you could edit the content just within the group that you're assigned to. And we also use Layout Builder. So the legacy platform had paragraphs and we switched that to Layout Builder. So, oh, sorry, I know I am right. Yeah, I should have come back. So, of the 50 sites, there was over 60,000 nodes and over 70 content types. And that's not 70 unique content types, that's just 70 content types with the same machine name. And then there is over 95 paragraph types and over 60 vocabularies. 
at the end of the day, there is over 37,000, or no, over, yeah, over 37,000 individual migrations that we ran. So, um, we'll talk, so the, this, less, or this session is about the lessons learned in that and how we, the, the, the tips and tricks that we learned and picked up along the way and uh, some things that made our lives much, much easier. So we'll go through that in this session. One thing I want to cover though is why we decided to rebuild versus upgrade. Um, or why you, you might decide in your project whether you're going to upgrade your site or just rebuild it. So Drupal 7 was released over 11 years ago. Some of you who were around then might uh, remember the parties, the Drupal 7 release party. So there, <coughs> there's a map and you should see all the parties all around the world. But you know, it's 11 years old and when it, you know, uh, reaches end of life as currently scheduled for next year, it's going to be 12 years old and technology moves on. And sites, like certainly if you have an early days Drupal 7 site, it's grown and it's grown organically and things have changed. You might move from field collections to paragraphs, so you might have both on your site. You're going to have made decisions that suited your organization back then, but your organization has moved on and your website has moved on. and it or your website hasn't moved on, and you need to refactor and rebuild. So it's simply no longer fit for purpose. And that's really why we recommend that you rebuild. It's the perfect opportunity to do a redesign and set up the site for the future, rather than carrying all your legacy, you know, legacy decisions and legacy infrastructure with you. And then, of course, there's the issue of abandoned modules where there is no upgrade path or where there's simply just no clear upgrade path. Maybe you have to use a different module, but there's no way to get from A to B. So, preparing for migrations. Get to know your data. Analyze, 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 analyze. Uh, so, there's no, too much, as, there's no such thing as too much planning. Look at all your legacy data structures, every single field and every single entity, whether it's nodes, paragraphs, field collections, vocabularies, beans, anyone, anyone remember beans? Uh, so you, uh, you need to get through, you need to understand your data. You need to understand what you're going to keep, what you're not going to keep. So maybe there's some content that is completely out of date and you don't want to migrate. So, you know, you need to know that. Or maybe there's some you do, but you want to restructure it. Maybe you want to move from field collections to paragraphs. Maybe you want to move from paragraphs to layout builder, like we did. So, you start by mapping your data structures. You create a spreadsheet, this is what we did, for every single entity, and you map it to where that data is going to live in the new site. So, this process can take a while. It can take weeks, it can take months, depending on the size of your migration and how many sites you're doing. And then you define your control data. So this is the, the data that you know covers the different aspects of the sites, the different combinations of fields, and you define that as your control data, and that's what you're testing with constantly. You run the migration, it doesn't work, you need to tweak it, you roll it back, you run it again. And when the Test pass with your control data, then you move on to, you know, doing it on the full thing. So this is an example of one of the many migration mapping strip, uh, spreadsheets we created. So, and this was all, <coughs> excuse me, this was all done by hand for all 50 sites, for all 95 paragraphs by all 70 content types. On the left-hand side, on the blue side, that's the legacy data structure. So you can see we've got the field label, the field name, the type of thing it is, and then like if it's a term reference or a paragraph sentence reference field, what it references, what can that field hold? Then you've got whether it's a required field, you know, how many values can it take? Is this a single value field, multi-value? Any notes you might want to keep? Now, for this particular uh, project, we also had a site column as to some of the fields, the ones in yellow, 
were only on some of the sites. Uh, so you can see that the news space was uh, only on the main site, in the core platform, whereas the private newsletter was only on the careers fairs uh, uh, website. And then some of them, like the additional content field, they were on all of the sites, but the configuration of it was different. And then you say what you're going to migrate, what you're not, whether it's done, and then you say whether, where it's going to in the new infrastructure. So this was all created by hand and was laborious. Uh, so Eric came up with a pretty nifty module for the next migration. Okay, thank you, Stella. So um, we like working with these spreadsheets. Um, because they're useful for collaborating. Uh, you know, front-end developers and back-end developers and site builders can collaborate on them, say where fields are going, um, what content types are we going to keep, what content types are we going to merge, do all sorts of things with it, and we can add notes to them. Um, Stella likes to color things in. Um, so when the next 777 migration came up, we looked at ways, that, could we automate the process of creating this spreadsheet? Um, and we have this little demo of a tool that we wrote. Um, it's a command line tool, and it will create a Google Sheet for a single entity type. And let's choose the paragraphs. Um, now we've got this overview of all of the paragraph types in the source site. This first tab gives us a list of them all, and then we've got individual tabs for every bundle. Um, Let's have a look at this first paragraph type, this 2CTA section. Uh, on this tab, we can see all the fields in this paragraph type. Uh, you can see there's some nested paragraphs in there, an image, and some text. And over here, we've got this, this figure, which is a usage. Uh, we count the number of times that field is used. And if we click on that, we get taken to this report. It shows everywhere it's being used and in what context. We've actually linked this up to the uh, client's legacy site. Uh, we can go there if we want to see it. We see that, that page directly. And we can also see some detail about the relevant entity. Um, let's see what's in this paragraph 1036. And now we get a nice little view of everything. There's a comprehensive view of everything that in that entity. I like to compare this one side by side with the existing site and kind of see what's what. Um, so do you have anything to add on that, that module? Uh, it's pretty nifty. It would have saved me hours of work if I had it on the University of Limerick site. So we are contributing it back. There is a, a rough version of it up in the sandbox. Uh, so we'd be cleaning that up a bit and making it more suitable for other sites. And yeah, that will be contributed back to the community. The URL is there on the screen. Yeah, thanks. Um, I want to pick up on the point that we made about, um, was it 3,700 or 37,000 migrations? Um, that's a big number, and we didn't write them all one by one, uh, as you probably gathered. Um, I just want to imagine a migration from a Drupal 7 site. Um, and we would have an individual migration, maybe for different kinds of entities, maybe some taxonomy terms, some nodes, users. We write each of those as a YAML file, and each of them gets turned into a plugin, which is quite a typical way to go about this kind of migration. Um, but the University of Limerick had one Drupal 7 site per faculty. So this is, this is just one faculty. Um, and they had, um, had about 50 faculties. So um, you can see how this, the number of these migrations just mushrooms. Uh, if, I had, if I had 20 things along here, 50 sites, immediately I'm up to 1,000. We can visualize this on this sort of two-dimensional graph We've got these definitions along here on the x-axis, and we've got the kind of variations of them along the y-axis. Um, 
We've also got, there's a few discrepancies, a um, few differences between these sites as they, they started off from one Drupal 7 site, it was copied to another one, a few changes made, copied again. So they've slowly diverged over time. Um, but what we needed is a way to take a, a, a base configuration for any one of these things and, and multiply it to get this number of uh, migrations, individual ones that we can run one by one and end up with all of the plugins that we need. Uh, it turns out that Drupal has just a thing for that um, called a plugin derivatives. Anyone here ever heard of the derivatives before? One, two, three, okay, about 10 of you maybe. Yeah, they're used in um, quite a few other cases, not just migration. Um, let's have a look at how these things work. Um, so we're going to take a, a typical YAML file, the definition of a migration. Then we add in an extra line to say that this definition uses a deriver. Now what happens is that um, that YAML file becomes uh, the definition of a base plugin. And it's up to the deriver to take this base definition and return lots of copies. And the driver looks something like this. It's got this get definitions function. It gets passed in the base plugin definition, which is the YAML we'll just be looking at. And this instance, it's returning uh, three migrations. It's creating one called arts, one called science, and one called language. And it's up to the driver to say, okay, I need to, um, I need to copy the base plugin definition, and maybe I need to tweak it, maybe I need to remove something, add something. The end result is that we end up with lots of migrations. Um, here are some faculties. Each, this is pulling in articles for each different faculty. And these are, on the screen here, we've got five different migrations. Each one is an individual migration, just like a non-derivative one. They've got individual queries that they run on the database, different amounts of totals. We can run, we can import one of these, we can import all of them, we can roll them back. They're just the same as non-derivative migrations. And these plugins can be thought of as normal plugins. They just have this slightly unusual name made up of the base identifier, and then a colon, and then the uh, derivative name. And other than that, they're exactly the same. So as Stella mentioned earlier, we opted to change the way we, the site was built from paragraphs and switch to using Layout Builder. Not only that, but we went down the route of giving a unique layout to every node where we were using paragraph layout. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the migration aspects of that. Quick bit about the um, Layout Builder terminology. The topmost concept within the Layout Builder is called a section and sections have one or more regions. So on this page, I've got two sections. Uh, one is a single column, uh, one's a three column. Every bit of content, uh, we can call a component. We place the components into the sections. And all of that information lives in a field on the node called layout underscore builder underscore underscore layout. I have no idea why it's named like that, with those underscores, but it is a field just like any other, and uh, we want to set that in the migration. And I'm going to talk about two aspects of the migration we need to get that filled in. First step I'll talk about is we need to get inline blocks created. So in Drupal 9, inline blocks are called block content, uh, that's the name of the entity type. And this migration 
is like any other migration. We're taking paragraph entities and turning them into block content entities. And we can use the process section to populate the fields that we have. Uh, the one field I want to draw your attention to is this thing called reusable. We need to make that false. If we made it true, these every block that we migrated would be available in a list uh, to add to every page. Uh, we don't want that. Um, these blocks that we're creating are intrinsically tied to one node. So we're just going to make sure that they're not reusable. Now we can run this. And we do run it first. But bear in mind that we haven't migrated any nodes at this point. So at this point, all these blocks are going to be orphans. So the next step is to match them up to nodes. Again, the node migration is like any other migration. We can hone in on this layout builder layout field that we talked about earlier. That's got to turn paragraphs into sections and components. And the first thing we do is we locate and we load our previously migrated block entity. We wrote our own plugin for this. Uh, and it looks a bit like this. It's going to use the migration lookup service first. That's going to give us the block ID. And then we load the entity. Second thing we want to do is make a component out of that block. A component describes how a block will be placed into a section. Again, we're at a custom plugin. Uh, we take our block and we set certain parameters. In this case, the region that we're putting it in. Uh, we're deciding whether to show the label. Uh, we're deciding what the label is and what view mode we want to see on the block. And we end up with this um, section component object at the end. And lastly, we create one or more sections. Again, we've got a plugin. We choose a layout that we want. And we put all our components into it. And then what we want to end up with is a, an array of sections right at the end. And all of that gets fed back into this magic layout builder layout field that we have. And that is how we went about migrating paragraphs to Layout Builder. We've got a few tips and tricks that we want to finish off with. Um, I'll hand over to Stella for the first few of those. Thanks, Eric. Just to add that we will be writing a blog post with the code, and we will be publishing the slides. And the blog post will go into more detail than what we've covered here, because um, there are some things about like that was a very simple example with a one column layout you know what if you've got the multiple columns how do you know what what goes where what if you've got a uh, a nested paragraph tree yeah so that would be more covered in the blog post later on and we'll we'll publish that so uh that's work so some tips and tricks first one uh, I mentioned earlier that you are in, you know, you're running migrations. They don't work. You need to tweak them. You roll back. You do it again and again. And then sometimes you're going, my database is completely messed up and I need to start afresh. So, nifty tip, you know, just site install. We'll reinstall the configuration with a clean database. But if you add the existing config parameter, it will take all the configuration that's currently exported to your YAML files and import that for you. So that's very handy when you're, you just want a clean slate to start and test with again. Also, if you are switching branches, um, the configuration can change. It's just a, if you're jumping between branches a lot for migrating different things or testing different things, that can be helpful. So uh, another thing that we recommend is that you turn off caching. Uh, for your configuration. 
you will be editing your YAML files over and over and over again. <laughs> and you don't want to do a Josh ca uh, cache here every time. So uh, that there will disable the backend cache for your configuration. Uh, obviously, you don't deploy that production. That's for your local. Uh, but it is very handy, and it saves you a, a bit of headaches. Uh, we also put the migrations in the migrations directory rather than config install. So that's a, actually another tip I should have mentioned. So you can just edit and clear the cache or don't, and it will be there. Another one that I fell, I fall foul of a few times is a search API. So you're working away in your migration, everything is fine. You merge in the latest uh, main branch into your migration branch, so you have the latest configuration, and somebody has configured Search API or Solar, and now every time you run a migration, it's also indexing the content you're migrating. Uh, that slows things down considerably, and when you're doing thousands of migrations, you don't want that. So uh, turn off search indexing, whether it's Search API with Solar or some other uh, tool that you're using, turn it off. And I'm sure uh, most of you who are familiar with migrations may be familiar with this already, but uh, there's the Drush, okay, Drush migrate import to, to run your, your uh, migration. But you know, the ID list uh, parameter is very handy if you just want to test with one particular entity ID. If it's a multilingual site, you probably also have a colon language code after that. And the migrate debug module, or sorry, not module, uh, parameter provided by, is it migrate tools or migrate plus? I forget which one is, migrate tools, I think. That's very handy. There's also the migrate uh, debug pre uh, parameter for when the entity doesn't get saved. Uh, you can still debug and, and print out some outputs. So that will display the, uh, the legacy inf uh, data structure and then also the new uh, data structure that you're migrating into. If it is, if you use migrate debug and the migration did create the entity, it will also give you the ID of the new entity created so you can then go check it out in your browser, make sure it's correct. All right. Next one, I'd say plan around your dependencies that you have. Um, so it's a good idea to order your migrations in such a way that when you come across the reference, like you know, do here, that the thing you're referencing already exists. So here I've got, um, I've got some category terms, and I've got some people, and I've got some articles. And articles have a taxonomy field that looks at topics, and the articles also have an author field that looks at a person. Um, now I would say it makes sense to migrate the categories and the people first, and then come back and do the articles. Now, you don't have to do that. Drupal has this concept of uh, migration stubs, where if it comes across a reference, pointing to something that doesn't, doesn't exist, it will create a kind of temporary placeholder node for it, reserve the ID, um, and then when you come to migrate the real thing, it will populate that placeholder and fill it in for you, uh, which, is, which is quite neat. Um, it can be a bit problematic because sometimes we find that, that we have reference fields that are pointing to nothing. They've just... Um, They've got bad data in them. And if we use stubs, then we end up with a stub node sitting around. Um, so I would prefer that we don't do that and we just order things in the right way. And we can't always do that. Uh, sometimes we end up with a circular reference. In this case, each person has a one particular article that's about their uh, biography. Uh, and then you might have to use a stub. Uh, what I would say, though, is, is one of these dependencies you can really think of as the main one. Uh, you can still think of this uh, in, a, in a kind of... You can still think of the article being dependent on the person. I would do that one as a, without a stub, and I'd do the biography with a stub. 
Um, links, links are hard, uh, particularly links in free form text like this. And um, particularly if you're mixing, if you're mixing migrated content with new content um, and you end up with something like this, um, good luck, because that's really hard to deal with. Um, uh, kind of everything that we just said about organizing your dependencies goes out the window here because uh, the link could be anywhere. Um, I think things that you can try here is, um, first of all, decide if your numeric IDs are actually a public interface. Um, these, these things do have a, a habit of leaking out and uh, appearing in various places. Um, but if you, if you can avoid that, then, um, then do. Uh, one thing you can try is to write a process plugin that actually looks up if there's an alias for node 123 and actually swap it out in the HTML. Um, there's another thing that we, we, we were playing around with just last week, um, which may work really well. We're, 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 we're still kind of trying it out, but that's to um, reserve a block of IDs for all your legacy content. And any new content, we, we give them a, a much higher number. Now this will work if you're migrating from a source that's about to become decommissioned. It's not gonna work if you have a continuous migration you could need to do. Um, but I'm kind of curious to see how, how well that works and if there are any issues with it. It would solve a lot of, a lot of problems. The advantage of that approach is you don't need to use the DOM import and, and you know the other DOM process functions that Migrate Plus provides. They're really handy for parsing HTML. You don't need to worry about doing that. You don't need to worry about link fields. You don't need to worry about redirects. So it can save a lot of pain, and I think it will work fine. Um, you also wouldn't need to worry too much about um, dependencies and broken dependencies because you can just you can keep the you can keep the node IDs the same, and if they're broken in the source, they're broken in the uh, in the destination, and that's okay. And by not doing a migration lookup to find out the alias, you're making it faster. Um, this is one that really confused me for a while, single values and multiple values. And it really confused me because they both have these two plugins and they both have a transform method that looks a bit like this. And I thought, what's going on here? This is not doing anything. Um, like, w w when would you use this? Um, turns out that Drupal did one of two things with the process plugin. It either treats the data that is given as a, a, a set of values, multiple values, and passes it, all of those to a process plugin. Uh, something like concatenating text would be a good idea. If you had five pieces of text, you want to concatenate them, you pass all five to the process plugin. The other thing you can do is you can call a plugin once for every single value. So if something like formatting a date would, would be one of these kind of plugins it operates on a single value. You have five dates, you call the transform method five times. Uh, now, Drupal normally kind of knows which one of these to pick and how to treat the data, but it can get it wrong. Um, so these, these plugins, um, they don't actually change the data in any way, but what they do is they will operate as a hint to the next plugin. Okay, you should be treating this data that happens to be an array as a single value, or you should be treating this data as multiple values. And we've got one more, is the migrations work best when I have a clean and simple source data to work from. If your data's hard, it's a bit jumbled up, Consider having a separate step before you even start the migration to clean it up. And I was working with a site that had data scattered across CSV files. 
and I was having to cross-reference things across different CSV files, and I thought, you know, if only this was, if only this was a database, then I could write a nice query with a join, and uh, it would be so much easier. But I've got to hunt through these different CSV files. So what I did was put them in a database. Uh, I just CSV is tabular data. It's nice to load it in. Um, I can also recommend using something like SQLite for this. There's no extra infrastructure you have to worry about. It's a single file. It lives in the private files directory. Uh, we dump our data into there, and now we can do much easier ways of querying with it. Um, I think that's it. Have you got anything to add? I think the, another thing about pre-processing and cleaning your data beforehand, sorry, I'll come up higher on stage, is um, try to avoid the step on process plugins as they mess up your count. So you'll see that you have so many unimported, and then you'll run the thing, and then you have a less number unimported and no fails. And then you're going, what happened to the other ones? Um, so if you can write a source plugin to um, you know, narrow down your data set in the first place, then your counts will be sane. Um, yeah, I can kind of reserve those skip, uh, those skip plugins for uh, error conditions, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, yeah, thank you Thanks for, for listening. listening. If you have any questions, there's a, we can give a microphone and you can run around, or not you can run around, but you can come up and, and take the microphone, put up your hand. There's also uh, the app, if you're more shy and want to ask the questions in the app, we can answer them that way. Yes. Um, thank you. You mentioned uh, data cleanup is a good idea before the migration, but we discovered in our organization that uh, the content owners are mainly non-technical uh, staff. Is there any tool in Drupal, maybe a module or anything else, that could help um, non-technical people to do data cleanup? I don't know of a tool in Drupal. We do use Streaming Frog to create a list of all the pages on the site in a crawl, and then we give it to the client, or, an, an, or a simplified export of it. You can have a lot of data from that crawl. Um, and they can use the basis of their content audit to do that. But we also have a content team who can work with the client to help them with that if they're struggling. Another question here? Not a question, but another trick. I had good success with installing the UUID module on Drupal 7. So I don't have to work with auto increments or it's then very easy. You don't have to keep the IDs because you have the UUID identifier on the entity and then you can always use this one to resolve from your destination to the source data set because the UUID is essentially the same but the ID can change it and I think it gets easier. Yeah, I haven't thought of that one. <laughs> yeah, UUIDs are useful. Um, it's also worth noting that if you get there are ways to create a, a UUID from an arbitrary string in a predictable way. So if you can, um, if you can get a key that you, you know is going to be the same, you can always create a UUID from it. Uh, one question here. So uh, here, close by. Um, did you do the migration in kind of one clean step, or did you do in incredible kind of steps where you kind of took it? Step by step. In development or in the kind rolling of, it out? Yeah, uh, in production. Uh, we did it in one fell swoop. Uh, so we obviously during development, you sort of just do what you need. We would have tagged each like node article as article, so we'd run all of those as one batch, and we would have also tagged them as one site, so we could do multiple grouping of things, so we could roll out one site and not another. Um, as it happens, we, we regularly ran it all from start to finish. And then there was some manual cleanup of data after we did the migration, because while the design wasn't changing for this particular project, 
there were we were consolidating and narrowing down components. So the 95 became 20 or 30. So we were saying, well, you have to make a decision as to which sort of layout, which sort of design you're doing. You have an insane number of paragraphs. Uh, so there was some tweaking required to the content afterwards. Um, so we did that sort of, we had a content freeze where they, uh, they could add new content if they wanted, but they, we, we wouldn't update the migration and they were doing manual edits to that. But yeah, we did it all in one soup. There was a bug in the migrate tools uh, module that meant when you ran everything in a batch that it would run the first migration, nice and fine, speedy. You run the second one, when it went to run the second one, it would run the first one again, and then the second one. It went to run the third one, it run one, two, and three, and so on, which was taking hours, like 12 plus hours. Um, that got fixed, and Patch went back, and it's much faster when you only do one at a time. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it took about three hours, I think, in the end, to top to bottom. Hello. Uh, I'm assuming that you had links inside content, uh, and in several projects, the links were referring to the same page or external pages. How do you manage to uh, do that? or to clean up the URLs in one only in the end project, since there are probably links that were referring to uh, Asian stuff, or what, did, what, uh, okay. what was your strategy? So the, the new strategy that we would, oh, naturally wouldn't work for this site. No, it wouldn't with the 50 sites. So the, we wrote process plugin to clean up the text. So the, I mentioned earlier the DOM import, DOM export, uh, process plugins by the Migrate Plus module. So we had a, and, th and then you can do manipulation, you can do on the DOM, like string, search, and replace. So we had process plugins that would parse the DOM, find links, and do a search and replace on them. But every site that we're migrating were ul.ie slash the name of the faculty or the stool. Uh, so you would, if it began with one of our 50, faculties, it would, we would manipulate it. If it went to, say, ul.ie slash library, which wasn't in scope for that migration, we would leave it alone. We're also a little bit fortunate with the, the university, because given that they had a site for each faculty, they would have www.ul.ie slash science. So if we found that there were uh, numeric things, it would be, you know, www.ul.ie slash science slash node five. Um, we migrating that into a single site that's just ul.ie, we could put in aliases with the old uh, site prefix in. So we have an alias now that says slash science slash node slash five, points to uh, node 250 or whatever it is. Got one more question, I think. One more. So I'm um, assuming you don't have much custom code on these sites, like there's no custom entities and anything like that you had to worry about. But it was a bit hard to create in D7, but you could. So I assume there would be some problems you would encounter if you had. There was custom code, a lot of it, but there is no custom entities, I don't think. We, I didn't migrate from any custom entities. <laughs> But if you did have a custom entity, you just write a custom source plugin rather than relying on you know, the D7 node or whatever is your base. Thanks, I think that's um, time there. Okay, if anyone has any further questions, I'm happy to talk afterwards. But uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming.